Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 9th, 2016. This is the week in charts. This week is brought to you by me. And more specifically, my daily trading service. So these are all the longs, recent longs, I should say. Uh, there were some recent shorts, too, but it just didn't make sense with this graphic. And most people don't short anyway, so <laughs> I guess it doesn't bother me. Uh, it doesn't help. Uh, it doesn't bother me. No, it doesn't bother me. Uh, yeah, I like to see people short, but uh, sometimes they just don't. Anyway, you can start for $47. There's a disclaimer screen. You can lose money trading or as I often sum it up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what are we going to talk about? Well, I'm going to continue my discussion last week. I realized after I did last week's webinar and then I went to write about it on Friday in my in my column I realized that it's just way too much information to cover just in one webinar or just one column in fact you could write a book on each one and I guess in some cases I have so I wanted to divide those out and focus on the second thing now one thing I did wake up to think about this morning is uh, everyone here or most everyone here is a friendly and knows who I am and kind of gets me but I realized that as the YouTube channel is beginning to grow that some people might not know who I am and I don't want to ever come across wrong and my point is that it's not my way or high, or the highway there's many ways to trade in fact that's what makes a market it's just that my way is the only thing that I've it, it's not the only way to trade but it's the best thing that I've found in over 20 something years of searching and trust me I've I've done the searching and I have the scars to prove it and instead of just studying things especially early on I just went in just dove right into everything and made a lot of uh, mistakes and learned from the school of hard knocks so if you are struggling here and there don't feel bad uh, just keep at it keep plugging away at it who was it Zig Ziglar once said um, a little shot is just a big shot that kept on shooting. A big shot is just a little shot that kept on shooting. I think I got that right. Um, and the other thing, too, is, again, it's not my way of the highway. If something makes sense to you, then use it. If not, toss it out. And I like to see that as sort of Dave a la carte. Now, let's focus on number two, the solid money and position management plan there's three things number one methodology which you obviously need number two a solid money management plan and number three the mindset to actually follow it so I like to see these things as a three corded rope and one cannot exist without the other and if you have all three of them working together as was said in Ecclesiastes 4.12, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And here's the beauty of it. And this is something that I've been fascinated with over the last couple of years. Once I sort of came up with this three-corded strand analogy is that if you get better at one, you get better at all. So let's say that you decide that you're going to follow your money management plan. Well, that's going to keep you in the game, and you're also going to be more likely to continue to follow the methodology, provided, of course, you get some winners and you get some losers along the way. So your mindset is going to improve. If you're following the methodology and then you do – get some winners along the way, then your money management is going to improve because you're going to say, you know what, I've got this stinker stinking up my portfolio. It's hit the stop. I'm just going to kind of see what happens. But you know what, if I got rid of that, I would no longer have to think about it. So my mindset's going to be better, provided, of course, it already hit the stop, okay? And then the other thing that's going to happen is that you're going to realize that the methodology works and that you can say, you know what, let's get rid of this stinker because it's taking up room for another potential winner. 
as I said before, and uh, one of my clients kind of helped me, reminded me of the uh, analogy, and he said he used to treat his stocks like children. Now he treats them as employees. I'm uh, a father of a couple of millennials, and I just want to kick them in the ass, you know, <laughs> these kids. I never thought I'd be the old fart that said, these kids nowadays, but I, I'm not giving up on them, okay? Not yet, at least. And it's like I keep trying to push them along and get them, push them down the road or get them down the road or get them out the door or something, okay? That's, that's what you do as a parent. But if you're trading, you don't treat your stocks like your children. You treat them like your employees. If you've got one employee that's busted his ass and you got two employees that are sitting on their asses, what are you going to do? Well, get rid of the two that are sitting on their butts and keep the one that's doing well. And trading people off to do just the opposite. They get rid of the one that's doing well so they can lock in that gain and then they keep the two stinkers in there. Okay. So psychologically, it could be quite tough. But again, as you can see, if you do begin to improve psychologically, then guess what? Your methodology is going to improve because what? You're kicking those losers out. Well, guess what's going to happen? When you kick those losers out, your money management improves. Now, what's kind of cool about this is this whole relationship is reciprocal in that it just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So it keeps getting better and better and better as you improve on each one. Now, it never gets easy, but it does get easier, okay? And I don't want to – and like I said, I often say I'm not holier than now. I, I put a joke. I, I got me Photoshopped into a um, – a robe, you know, preacher's robe and call me Pastor Dave and things. But I, I preach a lot, but trust me, I I, I drop F-bombs. I get pissed off. I, I, I F'd up just yesterday on something. And uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I've, I had a stop in place, but the stop didn't seem to get hit because I, I had something wrong happen. So I still make mistakes. I still do stupid things, but learn from them. And realize that it never gets easy. It does get easier. I had a string of winners recently, and I felt that Godlock-like complex coming on. And then what happens? Well, you get your butt handed to you shortly thereafter. So the market could be a very humbling type of thing. But it does get easier with time. Now, one thing about money management, it's, it's funny in the newsletter this morning I said, or the, the announcement for the for the webinar, it's like, I'm going to make money management as exciting as humanly possible. And, and I don't know. I, as I said before, one day I'm going to write a seminar on money management, and it'll probably sell two. <laughs> Money management, as I said before, it ain't sexy, it ain't pretty, but you got to have it. It's like the, the the old Allied Tire commercials. You know, tires ain't pretty, they don't smell good, but you got to have it. Well, that's money management. It's not very exciting. But I will tell you this. When I speak somewhere and everybody afterwards comes up and wants to talk about the methodology, specifically setup. So that's fine because I'm a setup junkie too. But when somebody asked me, someone asked me a money management question, I know that traders either made it or it's close to making it because they've kind of realized maybe there's no perfect methodology and maybe you need to focus a little bit on the money management. I think in my progression, it was like methodology as, as it is with everyone and then quite a bit on money management. And now it's like you'll see my focus becomes more and more on the psychology. And by the way, not to be cliche, but they are intertwined and it's like it's impossible to talk about one without the other. And that's why I love that little uh, cord example, the, the three-stranded rope. Because like right now, I'm working on this beginner's course, and every time I try to talk about the methodology, I start talking about the money management. Every time I talk about the money management, I talk about the methodology and the mindset. And it's like, it's, it's almost impossible, nearly impossible to talk about one with, without the other. And I have three sections, mine, money management, and 
methodology, and it, again, it's impossible to talk about one without the other. So you, you have to see them as a complete package. It cannot be separated. Now, money management will cure a multitude of sins. If you're only trading at a small size, it's much easier to follow your plan. Okay. If you're only trading at a small size, when you see the opportunity, it's much easier to take that opportunity because the fear of a loss is not that big of a deal. On the flip side, and this is a good problem to have, but I, I, it's a problem nonetheless. When we're riding out a really big winner, and I'll know somebody, I know somebody's actually in it, okay? And then a few weeks later, I talk to them, and they're a little bummed out. I'm like, what's the matter? This, this stock is still winning big. Oh, I sold that three weeks ago. It's like, well, why did you sell it? Well, you know, it was quite a bit of money, and I thought I better lock that money in. Well, if you quit at 50%, you'll never get to 100%. You quit at 100%, you'll never get to 1,000% on a trade. So... It'll be much easier to follow your plan on both sides and on the losing side. Eh, so what? It's just, it's what I would pay for. I don't play much golf, but I know around the golf isn't exactly cheap, but it's a couple hundred bucks. Depends on where you play. Uh, I, you know, we've got a, uh, I live in Louisiana, so a lot of our uh, golf courses are pastures where the green fees aren't too bad, less than $100. But still, it's not enough to where it would kill you. And if you go play a round of golf, or if you take your boat out or whatever, yeah, it's expensive. You might bitch a little bit about the cost, but hopefully it's an enjoyable experience. And he's like, eh, you know, it's just an expense. And that's how you have to see a loss in trading. And then on the flip side, you can't let the gains get you too excited and feel like you have to lock them in. You can't monetize those gains and say, well, I could buy a car with this. I could do this. I could do whatever. Because – as I'm going to kind of preach throughout today's webinar, you have to minimize losses and maximize gains. And I know it's a little cliche, and we talk about that too. But money manager will cure multiple sins. Now, okay, well, Dave, if you are trading at such a small size that it's meaningless, then, well, my gains aren't going to be that big. My losses will be small, but my gains aren't going to be that big. Well, the reason I'm I'm saying that is, this is assuming that you're not following your plan and you have to get the experience in and following your plan. So you might have to only trade at a half a percent per position and we'll get into the 2% in just one second, but you might have to trade at just like a half a percent per position until it becomes second nature to you. Okay. Um, I don't know how I'm getting off on this tangent, maybe because I was reading a book this morning and missed, they mentioned some uh, famous basketball players. But Anthony Robbins once said, I, I think it was Anthony Robbins, I'll give him credit for it, but uh, I think it was Michael Jordan, and they were filming a commercial. And as part of the commercial, he had to miss the basket from, I don't know if it was a free throw line or whatever. I, don't, I know very little about sports, but anyway – he made like 10 shots in a row because he was so trained to make baskets, okay? He, he worked so hard. He busted his buttocks for years and years and years to become who he was. So if you're not successful trading but you think you've got it all figured out as far as the methodology, you've got a solid methodology, you understand the money management, you realize the only missing piece might be your mind, and your ability to plan to trade and trade to plan, then by trading at a very small size, you're going to get the reps in. You're going to get that enough shots in to where it becomes automatic to you. So very uh, important. Now, again, I'm kind of beating a death, dead horse here, but money management will cure a multitude of sins. And this is the J.B. Weld of trading. Now, what's kind of interesting is I, I, I got that cures a multitude of sins, I was uh, working on a car, an old car. I'm still working on it. But anyway, uh, early on when I first had it, I was kind of poking around under the hood. And on an old car, especially an old rusty car, you can't just grab things, okay, especially if you don't know what you're grabbing. And I grabbed like a little, a little pipe 
that was part of a, a preheat on exhaust or something. I don't know ex exactly how it works, but it's something that has to do with warming up the, the top of the engine. I guess with the carburetor and all. Anyway, so I grab this little bitty pipe and I, and I break it off. And I'm like, ah, oh, shoot. So I went to the auto parts store and they they're like, nah, you know, lots of luck with that. It's a car, a 1975 car. And they said, you know, it's kind of a pick and a poke, but you might just check the dealers. You never know. They might have some old dusty uh, stock way in the back or clean out stock room or something, you know, just give it a shot. So I went to the, the parts counter and a guy nearly laughed at me. So a couple days later, and I know I've told the story before, so just bear with me. But a couple days later, I, I, I yet again, I had to go buy more parts and, uh, I'm in the auto parts store, and, and uh, these guys are – a lot of these guys, they, they get tired of being hot and greasy, and they like benefits, so they just work in an auto parts store where it's air-conditioned, and they just kind of um, – they enjoy what they do. So you, you get a lot of old mechanics in there, and my little mechanic friend says, well, Dave, what did you do? I said, I said well, I couldn't, I couldn't find the parts, so – I'm almost embarrassed to admit, and I said, I actually JB welded it. And JB weld is this wonderful little epoxy that you could actually glue metal together with. Okay. Uh, in this particular case, I don't think welding would have actually worked. <laughs> and he said, uh, when I told him what I did, he kind of laughed. And I said, Oh, he's, he's laughing at me. And, and no, he, he says that no, JB weld will cure a multitude of sins. So money management is the JB weld, the trading, it'll cure a multitude of sins. I don't know if that story works or not, but we'll, <laughs> so you have to have a plan in place. And I know it's cliche, but you have to cut your losses short and let your winners ride. And, the reason you have to do that is because trading is unfair. Now, I know many of you have seen this chart before, and I think I put it in all of my books. But obviously, if you lose 100% of your money, you're out of the game. You could make 10,000%, okay? But as soon as you lose 100%, you're out of the game. And that's why I focus so much on money management. That's why we're talking about money management to get today. And I don't want to throw anybody under the bus because I've had my scars and, and trials and tribulations too. But we all read about these famous traders who make all this money, but they subsequently blow up. And you can make a lot of money in the markets doing some very foolish behaviors. I was in a webinar just yesterday, and and the, the host of the webinar was Dave Mecklenburg with Tiger Shark Trading. And as part of his intro, he talks about uh, some guy out there that's, that uh, claims to have turned 12000 into three and a half million, and some other guy who was homeless and, and now is a multi-million dollar trader. And his point was, even if these stories are true, is it repeatable? Can you do it? And what is the Paul Harvey rest of the story? Now, I don't know about those gentlemen, but I ha I personally witnessed someone turn five thousand into a billion dollars. Unfortunately, he wound he round tripped it and ended up pretty much homeless, and he ended up actually on my doorstep. And at one point, he received a letter from his brokerage that said, "You obviously don't know what you're doing. We're gonna we're gonna you can no longer trade." Um. Unfortunately, they didn't do that when he was at a million dollars. They waited until he was down to only a few thousand dollars and decided that, oh, that's enough. Um, he's no longer with us. Um, he checked out uh, due to alcoholism. But those are some other stories um, altogether. But is it repeatable? I, I don't think so because I don't think he could have done it again. He was in the right place at the right time. He also had the proper mindset, too. I'm not taking anything away from him because what he did was absolutely amazing. Um, but when he was nearing a million dollars, I remember telling him, hey, why don't you why don't you cash out? Go to cash and keep maybe keep 100K to trade on or whatever you think. But put the majority of it in cash. You get some kind of annuity. And back then, I think rates were a little bit higher. 
So you're making 50 grand a year or so, whatever, even at like a 5% return, 40, 50 grand a year, which living in South Louisiana, it's not a lot of money, but uh, whenever it was, 15 years ago, that was a decent amount of money. You could have at least live. You wouldn't have to be homeless. You could own a home for that, believe it or not. At least back then you could. And he says, well, I'm not going to take trading advice from you. I'm like, okay, fine. Okay. So, again, you can make 10,000%, but as soon as you lose 100%, game over. So, if you lose 10% on an account, and you guys bear with me who've, who've seen this chart before. I, mean, I told you I was trying to make it as excited as possible. We've got death. We've got alcoholism. We've got a uh, million dollars. <laughs> uh, if you lose 10% on an account, okay, and you make 10% on an account, where are you? Well, you're at about 98.1% or something like that. Or yeah, 90, 98.9, I think. You're not at 100%. Okay. So the point is that if you lose 10%, you have to make back 11.1% just to get back to break even. Now, as you can see, if you keep the drawdown somewhere in this area here, it's not too bad. But once you start hitting 50%, then you got to make back 100% on your account. And then it grows geometrically or exponentially from there, however you want to look at it. So if you lose 90% of your account, you got to make back 1,000% just to get the back to break even. So trading is unfair because you have to make back a lot more than you lose. So you must cut your losses short, obviously, and you want to let your profits ride. And not just the opposite. By the way, and this is another thing that came up in yesterday's webinar. I could create a very accurate system. And so could you. Anyone can. I could create a system that's 90% correct. And so could you. All you need to do is take little bitty profits and huge losses. The old commodity adage, eat like a bird, shit like an elephant, comes to mind. Okay. And that'll work until it don't. You'll eventually blow up doing that. But you might have a pretty good run in between, and you might be 90-something percent correct. But that's not the way to win longer term. And we want to be here longer term. We don't want to make a lot of money and end up homeless, okay? We want to grow our account and be happy and be a functioning human being. Now, as I often say, the real money is in the longer term trading, but that's also where the risk is. So a lot of the aforementioned or traders that I hinted towards, or hinted about, who make all this money, did make it through longer term trading. But it is a very risky way to trade if you're trading purely for the longer term. The drawdowns will be abysmal. As I've said before, you're going to be right about 28% of the time, give or take a few percentage points. So over 70% of the time, you're going to be wrong. Well, it doesn't. that's okay to be wrong, but the problem is the drawdowns are going to be abysmal, in some cases in excess of 50%. And that's, again, very hard to recover from. Now, shorter-term trading, as I preach, much more accurate, much easier, not that it's easy, but much easier to capture short-term gains, to predict the short-term. In fact, you can only predict the short-term when it comes to the markets. But something bad could still happen. So if you're only allowing yourself to make so much money, which you can only make over the short-term, then something bad can still happen to you. So my solution to that is it doesn't have to be a dilemma. You can have your cake and eat it too. You can trade for both short-term and longer-term gains. Uh, good questions coming in. We'll get to those in just one second, I promise. Now, one of my epiphanies in more recent times, and you've probably seen it in a few of these webinars, is what happens on every trade, every trade. George Carlin once said, when you buy a pet, it's going in badly. And in one of his routines, he talks about pets. And my epiphany is, when you make a trade, it's going to end 
badly. Three things are going to happen. You're going to have a losing trade, number one. Okay? You may not lose the full amount because you may have the, – the trade may move in your favor and you may move that stop, but you may have a losing trade. You might, if you're following my money position management, you might hit the initial stop – I'm sorry, initial profit target and then stop out. So that's what I call the better than the poke in the eye trade. You make a little, but then you scratch out. You'll never get rich doing that, but that will keep you in the game, provided, of course, you don't get the big inevitable loser somewhere in between. But number three, the third thing that can happen to you is you actually get your short-term profit and then in the – and then – start riding out the longer term trend and in the end you give up some of those open gains so let's take a look at what that might look like so assuming we're just going to trade a generic pullback let's say we have an entry here and in this particular case i purposely showed that the stock did move in our favor a little bit and we brought the stop up a little bit but you stopped out you still stopped out for a loss okay this is your initial profit target here in scenario number two, this is the better than the poke in the eye trade. You make a little bit on this trade. It's actually you make 1% and you stop out at a scratch for 0%. Now, last week Aaron was asking, why not just do this all the time? Over the long run, do you think you'd do okay? And I think you would do okay except for the fact that occasionally you're going to get whacked on a trade. You're going to come in and a trade's going to open way down here. The stock's going to open way down here. And then you're going to be faced with a pretty big loss, and it's going to take a lot of little 1% gains to make that back, okay? So you're either going to lose on a trade, and maybe in this particular case, like, not as much as you intended. You're either going to hit that initial profit target and scratch out. You're going to make a little bit on the trade. Or, and this guy should be smiling here, but he's kind of frowning. You're going to hit that initial profit target, and you're going to start riding out the trend. You're going to capture a decent little trend along the way. And I, I drew this. This should be a little. This should be up here a little bit, a little bit higher maybe. And on a net net basis, you do pretty good on the trade. But in the end, of course, you're going to give up some of the gains. It comes with the territory. It's going to end badly. When you buy a pet, it's going to end badly. When you make a trade, it's going to end badly. So you have to plan ahead of time, and you can't be surprised when it hits the fan, okay? So in the end, you're going to have to give us some gains. Now, a lot of people say, well, Dave, you know, we were up 100%. Let's just – why did we take that? Well, because if you quit at 100%, as I said earlier, you'd never get to 200%. And a lot of times, you'll have some bumps along the way, and this is why longer-term trading – does have the bigger drawdowns. One, you, you're not going to be accurate, so there's a, only about a 30% chance you're going to make it to this point anyway. And then there's going to be some big drawdowns to the open profits. But that's okay. If you read uh, Curtis' Facebook, he talked about how Dennis treated drawdowns to open profits when he was dealing with the traders differently than just drawdowns from bad trading. You will have drawdowns to the open profits. That comes with the territory. So it's going to hit badly. There's make no bones about it. And it happens. And as I've said before, I'm going to show you something that you've probably never seen. This is a losing trade. This was um I think this one was a quite a while ago, but it was a it looked like a pretty good trade. Because this was an IPO and it was beginning to take off and made a nice little pullback, triggered and then came right back in, stopped this out. So it happens. Good questions. Keep them coming. So this is what I call better than a poke in the eye. This is a short side example. So it triggered and then it took a while, but it eventually got to initial profit target, then came back up and stopped out. So on a 100K account, for every 100K, Based on the stop, okay, risking 1%, you would make $1,000 on the trade per 100K, 
And then in this particular case, you scratch out on the remainder. It's better than the poke in the eye. Just yesterday, somebody was bitching. Uh, uh, I stopped out of this train. Uh. It's like, well, you hit the initial profit target. You made money overall. Send me the money. Centive Trading Co. I'm sorry, Centive Trading LLC. P.O. Box 298, Abita Springs, Louisiana, 70420. Since I've been doing this, how long have I been doing this publicly? Mid-90s? Since 95, 96? I think my first article came out in 1996. No one's ever sent me a check for the money they made that pissed them off. So it's going to end badly, but so what if you get a swing trade and only a swing trade? So what? You made money. Pat yourself on the back. Move on. You can't move on. Send me the money. Center yourself. Okay? Go get a massage maybe. Take enough money out to get a massage and then send me the rest. That way you're going to feel better and you're going to completely forget about the trade. So it happens. Sometimes you get better than the poke in the eye. Now, ideally, you end up with the have your cake and eat it too type of trade. And we'll take a look at a recent example. But unfortunately, like I said, it, it's going in badly. We gave up a substantial amount on this trade, but look what happened. So you get stopped out at 152% gain. And this is on a 100K account. So that's 8.4% plus 1% gain. So on one trade by itself, you made 9.4%. What has what has the S&P done since 2014? Nothing. Okay, it has it oh well over a year. Russell 2000 since in three years has it done anything? So just one trade makes that much of a difference on your account. But yeah, you do give up quite a bit in the end. As I said, it's going to end badly. Well, Dave, why not cash out at 152%? Or No, I'm sorry, 200%, whatever it was up here. Well, because if you cash out at 2%, you'll never make 1,000%. And we might have gotten, I hate to use the word luck, we may have gotten lucky and survived this little drawdown here in price, and it was only a correction that the stock takes off again. Okay. So the odds, 3 to 1 perpetually. Well, if you or trading only for the long term, yes, the odds are three to one against you, okay? If you're trading for the shorter term, it's going to be a little closer to 50-50, okay? In good conditions, it might be 60 to 70%. In mediocre conditions, 50-50. Uh, and I don't trade when things aren't really that good or I'm super selective, so those numbers go way down because there's no there's no capital being risked. Um, and we'll get to that in just one second. But yeah, your, the odds are three to one against you, but that's where the money is. So you take that hybrid approach where you look to get that partial profit out, that swing trade. In this case, it took a little bit longer than a swing trade to get your profit out. And then the longer term trend materialized. And we'll take a look at a live example again in just one second. Okay. Now, I'm glad you brought up that three to one. And this is something I wanted to mention. And I've talked about this quite a bit before, so you guys have been around for a while. Bear with me. Let's say you're going to risk one on a trade and you're going to take profits at three. Well, that looks pretty good in the textbook. Okay. Three to one, three to one. Every time I win, I can have three losers. That sounds great. That's a great system. Well, you're three times more likely to get stopped out than you are to make that. So guess what? The odds are against you three to one. So my only way to wrap my head around all this and make it all work is to trade for the swing trade, take a swing trade profit, and then stick around should the longer term trend materialize via a gradually loosening or gradually widening protective stop. Now, a lot of times I don't do anything. I leave the stop where it is and let the stock move a little higher, and then that widens out. Okay, we start off with a swing trade, fairly tight stop. And in the end, when it ends badly, 
it's pretty wide, okay? So this is my only way to figure out how to have your cake and eat it too. You trade bio stocks, yes, quite often. I think we have one in the portfolio now. We'll take a look at it if you want. What is the maximum percentage of trading capital that should be in a trading positions? What is the maximum trading capital that should be risk? Well, it's 2% of your capital if stopped out. Now, your margin can get fairly high uh, in doing that. So let's say, let's just see what this trade was. So we got 1,000 shares. So what's 1,000 times 11 equals $11,000, okay? So in this particular case, based on the stop, we had $11,000 in a trade. Now, in a 100K account, that's a substantial amount, okay? At the stock with a zero, you would obviously lose 1,000. I'm sorry, you would lose 11%. You'd still survive, but you'd be pretty aggravated, okay? Now, chances of going to zero probably – Probably not, if provided you use it to stop, okay? So it's not going to gap through your stop and go to zero. I mean, it could. Anything could happen, right? But probably the worst case scenario is you maybe lose half of that amount. So that's about, what, 5.5% of your account? And ideally, and hopefully, you're only going to lose 2% worst case scenario if stopped out. Now, I don't have it in this presentation, but if you go in and watch the YouTubes, watch as many as you can stand. And as my friend Greg Morris says, just don't operate any heavy machinery afterwards. Okay. You'll see in one of the presentations, I showed that a less volatile stock is actually more risky because of your exposure than a more volatile stock. So, if you're trading, let's say, a $50 stock with a one-point stop and you're buying a 1,000 shares of that stock or whatever, the, let's see, what would that be? If you're just risking one point, you buy 1,000 shares? 2,000 shares. So you bought 2,000 shares of a $50 stock. I have a spreadsheet somewhere. Let's see, 2,000 times 50. That's going to be like, yeah, your whole account's going to be in that one stock tied up in margin. And the reason you would trade so many shares is because of the volatility. In order to make all the math work, you need to trade more shares. So my approach is to trade more volatile stocks. And I have, I have, it's not my way or highway, again. But I have brought a lot of people around to my way of thinking. It's okay to trade a volatile stock better than the devil you know. I did an article on that not too long ago. Actually, I think it was republished from an article I did at Traders Magazine. But it's on the website. Is trailing your stops discretionary or mechanical? It is discretionary. And um, I've done quite a bit of shows on trailing stops, so go in and watch the YouTubes. But there's a couple things I do just real quick. Let's say a, a stock like this uh, starts out in like low double digits. Let's say it's at. Uh, let's say we got a we got a stop uh, our initial profit target in here. So it's a, it's at 13. Okay. Well, let's say it goes up to 13 and I don't know 15 cents. Okay, 13, 15. Well, I'll do what's called keep the change. I'm not going to bump that stop up 15 cents. So my stop widens by doing nothing by 15 cents on that day. Okay. Now let's say it moves in my favor two points. We have a pretty good day. OK, and it goes two points in my favor. Well, what I might do instead of bumping it up that entire two points on a one to one basis, I'll bump it up one point. So we gain one ground on the position. You are you're always gaining ground. When the stock moves in your favor, when you're tightening that stop, you're always gaining ground on the position. And you can't look at the maximum where it is. You have to look at how much ground you gained in this particular case from there. All the way to back, back here. Okay, let me redraw that. So this is how much ground you gained through this gradually loosening trailing stop. Now, this trailing stop 
longer term will begin to look like a longer term moving average. And that's simply because what I do now, when I used to do presentations, it would take hours. And I realized it was just it was just too much work. Uh, you get the idea by seeing this this stop in here. This is not exactly to scale. It is here and it is here. I just kind of connected the dots in between. But I used to go in and every day when there was a position like this, I just update that stop when I made these these charts. So in reality, it's going to look a lot more like a stair step. OK. But if you blur your eyes, it kind of looks like a longer term moving average as I have it drawn in here. The only problem with using a moving average is that that moving average is going to constantly gain ground on the position. And there might be times like, let's say, like right through here. Look, see this big old consolidation in here? What happens is you have a drop-off effect, so you're adding in higher prices and you're dropping off lower prices, okay? Let's say the moving average is this period here, whatever that is. So even if you're in a consolidation, just to stop things from being too confusing, let's say you're in the middle of this consolidation, and in order to calculate the moving average, you're adding in this price and you're dropping off this price. Well, even though the stock is kind of losing ground in here or going sideways, that moving average is going to continue to gain on the position. So you might end up getting stopped out like right here, right before it takes off. So that's why you don't necessarily want to use a moving average as a stop, but it's okay to use it as a guideline to help you find your way. So uh, to answer the question on maximum, I don't really have a maximum as far as position size, but usually when I'm doing the sizing going in, I have that stop fairly wide in order to ride out that shorter term volatility. And I'm going to refer to a couple of videos on that in just one second. So in doing so, plus I tend to trade more volatile stocks, a combination of the two means that my stop is going to be fairly wide. And when you put the wide stop into the math calculation, it's not going to be a huge percentage of the portfolio. But I don't know. Uh, Maybe 10% would be the max I'd like to see in any one position. Maybe a little bit more than that. Depends on how it all sets up. Your less volatile stocks might have less volatile, higher price stocks. Not that I trade those that often, but possibly on the short side on some of those, you could end up with a fairly sizable position size. But usually on those, I'm a little more liberal than the volatility would suggest to try to ride out the slide like we did in this uh, UAL position, okay? Let me just go back to that one second. Uh, the stop was fairly wide on that at nine points, okay? So at nine points, that's a pretty wide stop. And you're only down to, what's that, uh, 200 shares round numbers. So what's 200 times 50? Is that 1,000? Well, I guess it was 60 at the time you went in. So 200 times 60 equals 12,000. So about 12% in one position in this particular case. But you can't see it as 12%. Oh, my God, 12%. Okay, now it, something bad could happen, obviously. But for the most part, you're not going to lose 100%, and you're probably not going to lose 50%. And if you're using stops, of course, that, that's with the caveat that you're using stops. Yeah, it might gap through, but you're probably not going to lose more than 50%. So I don't know, put a put a gun to my head. My wife tells me to stop saying that, but uh, put a gun to my head. Uh, I'd say 10 to no more than 15 percent. But it's not going to come out. It's not going to get much more than 10 percent anyway, based on the way I set stops and based on the volatile stocks that I like to trade. OK. So we're going to risk 2 percent on every trade. And then the stop is going to be based on the volatility of the stock. We take half our partial profits when the risk equals reward. That's a one-to-one -one basis. Now, the system developers will say, no, it should be three-to-one or four-to-one or whatever, but we're going to hang around longer term to make many times to one, hopefully, on the remainder. So if the trend materializes, you're still in. If it doesn't materialize, you made good money. At least you made something, okay? You get the better than the poke and I trade, of course, boring overnight gaps. Now, 2% is something that I I forgot 
I've forgotten where I originally got it from. Maybe, maybe from Larry Connors way back in the trading markets days, or maybe on my own, or maybe would work with a hedge fund. I forget where exactly I got the two percent, but it seems like that seems to be the somewhat magical number when it comes to trading. Two percent is enough to hurt, but you could live to fight another day. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Stop me if you heard that before. And this is provided that you obviously don't have too many 2%. Now, the way you do that is through good stock selection and good market selection. A lot of times, market's choppy. Day after day after day, I'm boring everyone to tears in the trading service. Don't do anything. Don't do anything. Don't do anything. There's no setups for today, by the way. Okay? So that's my free advice. But it's a free advice that you just didn't take, right? Because a lot of times I'll get emails from people. Dave, I just lost on 15 trades. And it's like, why would you take 15 trades when the market is going sideways for months? But people, for some reason, look for, for perfection in life. But when it comes to markets, they settle for mediocrity. So that's provided, of course, you have good stock selection. Now, keep in mind that, and this never goes away either, your positions will always seem too small when you are right and too big when you are wrong. And that 2%, at least for me, seems to be the magical number. I'll get to those some of those questions outside of money management. I'll get to in just one second. Now, as I alluded to earlier, stops need to be based on the volatility of the underlying instrument to ride out a shorter term move. So if the stock is bouncing around four and five points a day, any stop within that range will be hit on noise alone. I have two videos where I talked about that and just that. So if you go to my website under videos, and these were in the weekend charts, so you'll see weekend charts at the top. Go down to many more. I had them all on one page, but it's just the page was just taking a day to load. So go to many more, and you'll see those two videos, and they were in April. And while you're at it, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and then you could also go to the playlist for the weekend charts, okay? So, again, this is what the 2% looks like. You're risking $2,000 on a 100K account. In this particular case, I was looking at this stock, and I figured, okay. Now, sometimes, as you'll see in that video, those videos, I should say, if you have a TKO, let me draw this in better. Say a stock's plodding along, and all of a sudden, you got that big TKO move that looks like this. Sometimes, you can enter right above the high and put a stop right below the low. In this case, that was a little bit more than two points. Or right about two points, I should say. So that's what I decided to go with, a two-point stop, okay? So two points, $2,000, you would 1,000 shares, okay? 500 is allocated to a short-term swing-type trade. 500 is allocated to a longer-term trend-following trade. You don't make two trades. You make one trade of 1,000 shares in this particular case. If the stop was at four okay, points, then you would trade 500 shares, okay? So the more points you risk, the fewer shares you're going to trade to make the math work, to compensate for the risk. We take partial profits when we're up two points. This is plus two points, okay? So that's how much is that? Well, it's going to be $1,000. You're not going to get rich $1,000 at a time, but it's better than the poke of the eye. Keeps the lights on. Puts a little money in your pocket. You got a lot of frictional costs. Somebody was complaining the other day. Oh, somebody was complaining this morning. Oh, data feeds are expensive. I don't like spending money on, well, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> you got to spend money, make money. It costs a little money. And that goes for any business. So, but making a little money helps to cover some of those costs. And then your real money, obviously, is in the longer term trend. And you stay with that via a gradually loosening longer term stop. Okay. Now here's a more current example. Uh, this is um, this is left in from last week, 
but this is C and X. And if you go in and watch last week's show, you'll see that this was actually a bow tie. It's also a nice little persistent move off the lows. Now, if you study my persistent pullback pattern, which I think is under free reports, if you go to store under free reports, you'll see that persistent pullback, I like to see about 20 days in the chart. Well, this is an emerging trend pattern. This is actually a bow tie. And we don't quite have 20 days here, but it, we do have a nice persistent move. So that's one thing that I've actually learned through teaching is that the shorter term persistent moves can be worth trading, can be very worthwhile. So in addition to a bow tie, we had a first thrust and a nice persistent move off of all time lows in this particular case. Now, the stop was ridiculously wide on this stock, okay? But that's what it called for. Volatility was insane, insane in the membrane, insane in the brain, okay? But that's what it called for. So it was like a 34% stop. But if you go back and watch those aforementioned presentations, you'll see that this thing had made some pretty serious drawdowns along the way, 30-something percent or 30 percent drawdowns along the way. Now, if you squint your eyes, this just looks like a stock in a nice, 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 nice uptrend. But these moves here are very, very substantial, and that's why, hence, we're using such a wide stop. That's what it called for, okay? Good questions. Keep them coming. I'm going to get to them. I promise you. I promise you. So as I say ad nauseum, you want to obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. Now, too many people do, do just the opposite. I know it's cliche, but you need to plan that trade and then trade the plan. But most people get into a trade and then they start stressing out. So again, another cliche thing, you want to pick the best and leave the rest. If the stock is bouncing around and looks like an electrocardiogram, then leave it alone. I'm an ex-computer guy. I guess I still am a computer guy. You never stop being one, do you? Uh, I have a degree in computer science, and I learned early on, garbage in, garbage out. That's an old computer term. But if you have done your analysis properly, and you're trading these really nice transitions, these bow ties off of major lows with persistency in them, or if you're trading existing trends like that aforementioned setup where you had acceleration of trend, persistency of trend, and a really pretty trend knockout, and that's what you're aiming for is that perfection going in or as close to it as possible, then you're going to get something, not on every trade, but longer term, you're going to get something good out. But if it's garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. So I talked a lot about money management today, but as I often say, a good offense is often your best defense. So make sure you have picked the best stocks going in. If the market is going sideways, like we talked about last week with the net net change, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes, then you need to be super duper selective in your stock picking. And if you're watching recording of this, I'll have to remember to put a, uh, a link in here but if you go to my website slash stock selection course geez I forgot the link now uh, just go to store it's in the home menu and then you'll see the stock picking course in there in fact if you get the course I'll give you a year of the service free that actually saves you fifty dollars on the service plus it saves you uh, fifteen hundred dollars total this week only. How's that? All right. Now, let me answer a couple questions before uh, I get into announcements. Okay. Mark, check it in from the UK. Hey, Mark. Good to have you. Good morning, Joe. Lots of friendlies here today. Other side of the country. Okay. Phil Ho. Do you ever consider a percentage on a trailing stop? Uh, no. OK, um, you could you could. And I guess in effect, some ways I am. 
because as that stock goes higher on a point value, it's going to take more points, and so that percentage is going to automatically increase. Um, I spend years and years trying to quantify everything, and now I just spend years and years trying to to eyeball it. What did Yogi say? You can you can observe a lot by watching. I just try to watch what's going on and use my brain, as I said earlier. So uh, percentage, I think, could be kind of dangerous to use. Uh, I just kind of watch it on a point basis. And let's say I go in a stock at three points, and then I kind of watch how it widens out. Maybe it gets to four points, and I let it keep it at four points for a while. And then as it starts, you know, like a keep the change situation or jumps up a couple of points, then I might bring it to five points and just slowly kind of widen it out. Now, I've done quite a few presentations on this before, so go in again and watch as many as you can stand. But if you capture a trade right, you're going to capture two things. You're going to capture an expansion, obviously, in price. The price is going to go higher. So percentage-wise, yes, you're correct. That stop has to widen out. But the second thing that's going to happen is you're also going to capture an expansion in volatility. So as that volatility increases, so will your stop, but you're just going to let that happen gradually. You're not going to move your stop in the opposite direction. So trading done properly, you get an increase in volatility and an increase in price. So the point I'm trying to make is the stock that you're in now is not the same stock that you were in before. So any type of fixed type of thing, I think you could probably just throw out the window. And just don't overthink it. Just let that stop kind of widen out. And to the point where when you end up longer term trend following, it should, when you make that transition, like the, the chart I showed earlier, it was up over 200%, stopped at 150%. It should hurt. That's how wide your stop should be once you're in the trade, once you're in a longer term established trade. Every now and then I look at the portfolio and go, ay, 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 if that thing gets hit, that's going to suck, you know. But then, not not more often than not, but often, the position will continue to move in our favor and we'll continue to gain ground on that stock, okay? Uh, Phil says, when you have raised the stop before you hit the initial profit target, you move it back up to break even point. When you do hit the initial profit target, and give it much room as possible. Yes, so what Phil's saying is, on the initial trade let's say the stock begins let's say we enter here our stop is here it, let's say it moves in our favor well we begin to ratchet that up now in more recent times phil actually asked me this a few weeks back he's never seen me actually move the stop on the first initial on the initial loaf but i will move the stop before the the initial profit target is hit this tends to be on a more one-to-one -one basis. In more recent times, I've been a little bit more liberal in moving that and don't move it up as fast. There's a trade-off in trading, and that's why they call it trading. The more room you give a position, the more likely you are to capture a gain. Unfortunately, if you're stopped out, the gain doesn't ensue, the more likely, you, the, well, not the more likely, the more you will lose in the trade. So I try to kind of strike that happy medium and give it enough wiggle room going in I don't know if that answers your question so but yes when let's say we start ratcheting the stop up and then let's say we hit that target come in we have a big day hits the target we immediately bring that stop to break even on that particular loaf okay so yes that happens intraday okay a couple of announcements uh, more questions coming in that's fine keep them coming uh, website rollout continues uh, if you have any feedback let me know one thing that I've been doing lately and it's kind of a uh, a slow process. Um, someday I need to hire some people, but uh, for now, <laughs> it'll just take time, I guess. But I am finding and uh, uploading, some, like I used to sell the Wicked Charts, the show you're at now, obviously. I used to sell them on thumb, dr thumb drives, but it just was, um, it just they, they sold like hotcakes for a while, and then it became, they slowed down. I think everybody that was going to buy one bought one. 
And then so now what I'm doing is I'm actually giving them away. It's, I'm going back to the old Internet model. Give everything away for free. Make it up in volume. <laughs> uh, but hopefully you like what you see and then you'll you'll come in and, and join me for the service and, and for more detailed um, training. And that would be wonderful. But anyway, I'm rolling out those old week of charts. So every now and then, if you're on my Google subscribe list, you'll see an old week of charts pop up. And right now I'm working on 2014. When I get that done, I'll probably back up a year and go to whatever I have for 2013. And I'm finding a lot of good stuff way back there, believe it or not. And it's kind of a, it's kind of got me excited that I didn't realize I had so much content out there. So each day it's like I'm discovering more and more content and rolling that out. Um, and some of the stuff is putting and put it to the website on the on the like far back end. So if you ever get really bored, just dig through all the archives on the uh, on the website and find it there. And the reason I'm doing that is for, um, I guess for the main reason, I guess is for SEO purposes. Um, but that's for you too. So hopefully you'll. Uh, You'll find that on your own. Now, the main reason I'm putting them up on YouTube is not for SEO. It's just so that that content is up there. And as people ask me questions about things we don't have time to cover, it's like, okay, go back and watch this week of charts from 2014 or 2013. Anyway, all right. See you, Travis. Okay, what are the pros and cons of carrying stops overnight before you are uh, trailing them? Uh well, obviously, if the market gaps through your stop, you can't use discretion. That would be the con. The pro would be if you got busy and forgot that you had a trade on, at least you got stopped out, okay, in case that market gap lower and kept on going. So Norman says, thanks for giving a damn about trading discipline. Oh, you're welcome, Norman. We will have a lot more good stocks in the land you list. Somebody this morning was pointing out, I think Phil from uh, UK was pointing out a stock that I mentioned last night that I actually mentioned it three months ago before it doubled. So a lot of good stuff in that land you list sometimes, if I say so myself. Do you use TradeStation? Uh, not anymore. I do have a copy, but it's right now. It's at a computer. It's in storage. Uh, I've got the old version with the dongle or whatever they call it on it. That's back when I did a lot of uh, system programming. Uh, do you program the bow ties into programs to help spot them? Uh, I have a scan which somebody wrote for Telechart. And I was using it a while back, but only because I was working with a hedge fund that was at, that, that was paying me to find uh, – give them a list of optionable bow ties for them to trade. Uh, that's the only reason I was running. I actually look at, as I often preach, 2,000 stocks a day. I no longer uh, run those very specific scans. I'll give you the exact scans that I run. I look at most of that tradable universe, and somebody was asking me about volume. My tradable universe is a minimum of 250,000 volume. Uh, ideally, I like to see a stock around 500K or more in volume on, let's say, a 30-day average. You could use 50-day average. It doesn't really make a difference from what I've seen. But 250, you get below 250, it starts to get a little iffy. As a private trader, you can let it go below 100K. Some of these these crazy IPOs that I trade are pretty light on volume, okay? But as a general statement, 250K at least on volume would be a good uh, good round number to go with. If today's choppy market resolves itself, either up or down, a recognizable trend, what might that look like? I don't know. Uh, like Potter Stewart, I guess I'll know it when I see it. Um, as I preach one day at a time. And we'll take a look at the charts in just one second. I do have a couple of charts I need to pull up real quick. You guys want to ask questions about individual stocks, please start now. Um, one reason I'm not hugely mechanical in my trading, although my, I have a, a friend of mine who's a, more of a mechanical trader, he thinks I'm more mechanical than I admit to because I do things mechanically a lot of times. And then I think he's more discretionary than he admits to because he does apply discretion to his systems. I actually now know of a second system guy, same sort of deal. But the reason I believe in discretion is it's hard to put exacts when it comes to the markets. Like we had a huge winner a while back, came down, nicked the stop. It, the stop was at nine. It came down, it touched nine. 
there were two trades at that level, both 100 shares each. It never did dip below nine. So the hard stop, yes, it stopped out. Mechanically, it stopped out. But using a little discretion, you could have stayed with the trade, which turned out to be the biggest winner of the year. So you have a brain in your head, use it. And somebody says, well, Dave, why don't you set the stop at 8.99? Well, if I was that good, you'd never see my fat ass again, okay? You can't, you can't whittle it down to those exacts. But you have a brain in your head. Like in this particular case, this came within 40-something cents of the stop, and it's a $45 stock. So it's it came pretty darn close to that initial protective stop. Let me just do this here. I'm sorry, to the profit target. So I said, and I know everybody has to has to have exact. So I do have the exact initial profit target in there. And then I told everybody two nights ago, okay, guys, um, if it gets close to that 47 initial, uh, or was it 46? If it gets close to the 46, then by all means take it because it came pretty close today. If it comes close again, go ahead and take partial profits. It's okay to take partial profits a little early when it gets close like that. So, But I knew everybody wanted some sort of exacts. So I said, okay, 45 and a half. I think I have my numbers right. So 46 and a half. Let me just confirm that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the initial profit target was 47. So on this particular day, I said, okay, guys, anything 46 and a half, close enough for government work. And then I put out a tweet yesterday saying close enough for government work, okay, because it was trading at 46 and a half. And then it's back. It's it's coming back today, which is a good thing. So following mechanically, uh, you're still waiting for the initial profit target to hit. But the real money is not in the first half of the trade. That's why it's okay to take profits a little bit early. So what if you only make $930 or $50, whatever the case may be, and not that whole $1,000 per 100K? That's okay. Because hopefully, and there's a word you should never use, I know that, but hopefully you're able to ride out a longer-term trend, kind of like the CNX that we're hanging on to now, okay, from back here. So far, so good. Knock on wood. A little bit of a pullback today or a little bit of a consolidation lately, but so far, so good. Somebody was asking me about, they said they got a bad fill in ACIA. This is a little IPO we're trading. Okay, so far, not working so great. Okay, hey, look at that. I just showed you a trade that's not working. Um, if you're dealing with a $40 stock, it's an IPO, it's a thin IPO, and you got a 23 cent slippage on a fill, that's that's nothing, okay? So just, it comes with the territory. The only point I'd like to make on that, uh, this is not a great example, but the only point I want to make on that is often, as I think they wrote in Market Wizards, your best, your worst fills would be best trades. Because here's the deal. If you ever get your exact price, and it's like, I used to have a broker, he would tell me, you got your price. It's like, well, shit, I am lost money on this trade or I'm losing money on this trade. Um, I'm not that excited to, 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 quote, unquote, get my price. But sometimes you'll find where you get a really crappy fill. That's because nobody wants to sell and everybody wants to buy it, supply and demand. So you can't trip over the dollars. I'm sorry, you can't trip over the nickels while going for the dollars, which is a whole another presentation that I did. Hopefully is allowed, but should is banned from my cabinet. Yeah, should, what should happen. Okay, uh, let me just take a few minutes, take a look at the overall market, and then we'll open it up. To, uh, well, keep 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 your stock picks coming in. Okay. I just want to point out a couple things in the overall market. Obviously, we're down a little today in the S&P 500, about a half a percent. Not the end of the world, but... What does concern me is like, even though we've done fairly well since February, at least on a net net basis, if you look at where we were back in April, you could see we're pretty flat for almost two months in here, or it'll be two months soon, seven weeks, I guess. So we're flat for the last seven weeks. So that's a little concerning, although we have improved as of late today, notwithstanding. 
But when you back the chart way out, we still have to get past these prior peaks in here. So this is still some overhead resistance or supply, whatever you want to call it, we have to deal with. And what amazes me is people are coming out there and, and they're talking about how bullish they are. Well, I'm just prudent. I'm not bullish. I'm not bearish. I'm just prudent, okay? And for me to get excited, this market would have to break out to new highs and stay there. If this is truly a bull market, then just give it a little bit more room to see if it could break out and stay there. Right now, that hasn't happened. Uh, one thing that's a little concerning, much, 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 much longer term, and if you go back and watch prior presentations, you'll see see that I've drawn it in. Maybe I could draw it in today for you. Starting in 2009, obviously, we've had a pretty good run, which makes the buy and hope crowd think that, hey, everything's great. Let me just get this out of the way. But you can see, yeah, it pretty much went straight up for a long, long time. But what have you done for me lately, as Janet would say? Not uh, not Fed Janet, the other one. We're going mostly sideways. So I like to see a market make forward progress as a trend follower. Because what happens when you stop making forward progress? Well, it's not guaranteed that you'll go lower. But... There's a chance. Obviously, 2000 that happened and 2007 that happened. So is this another 2007, 2008? I don't know. Okay, we, we have some longer term sell signals that are still in place that will remain in place until and unless the market breaks out to new highs. Russell 2000 coming back in a little bit today. Not the end of the world. Shorter term, intermediate term looking okay up here today, notwithstanding towards multi month highs. That's a good thing, right? But back to chart out a little bit, as I've been saying, at nauseam. And you can see we have a mountain of overhead supply to overcome. Nothing magical about that. Just an area where people bought stocks and will likely be looking to get out to break even. There are a couple of areas like health services that are breaking out to new highs. But for me to get excited about them, they're going to have to keep breaking out. And then eventually, obviously, correct. But I don't want to see that correction right away, which will get us back in past the prior highs. And a lot of cases, a lot of areas have kind of broken out, but then have made no forward progress, like retail. Okay, yeah, everybody off to the races at retail. But again, like Janet says, what have you done for me lately? Still a bull on the metals and mining, today notwithstanding. Uh, as a general statement, they have worked their way higher off of major, major lows. So I think this is just the beginning of a, of a huge possible bottom here. In fact, are we in, do we have weekly bow ties yet coming off of these uh, major lows? Let's see. Uh, yeah, we're, we're almost to weekly bow ties in the energies. And I think, yeah, we weekly bow ties in the metals and mining. Okay. This is a major, major buy signal in the metals and mining. Now, daily, eh, it's kind of getting a little... Uh, Choppy in here, losing a little steam, tried to take off, coming back in a little bit today. But for the most part, they worked their way higher. By the way, you're wondering why I'm not recommending anything for today. Well, where's the market now? Where was the market a few months ago? Where's the market uh, several months ago, many months ago? Where's the market a year ago? Okay, not a whole lot of forward progress. It also looks like a electrocardiogram. When the overall market looks like a electrocardiogram, then obviously most stocks are going to look the same. So just not a whole lot to get excited about just yet in the market. But we have been kind of chipping away at it. IPO here and there, metal and mining stock here and there, energy stock here and there. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's look at those stocks you want to look at. Uh, Rick wants to look at USO gladly. That's going to be oil. And let's zoom in a little bit. Keep the stock picks coming. Good. Uh, yeah, we've got a bunch to go through. We'll get there. Um, oil's looking pretty good. Okay. Uh, keep in mind the commodities are going to be kind of choppy. I wouldn't rush out and buy oil right now, but I think it's bottom. Let's take a look at the bow tie here. Let's take a look at the weekly bow tie. Not quite a weekly bow tie yet, but working on it. I think your opportunity would be in the energy stocks versus energy itself, at least at this particular point in time. Okay, uh, Heath wants to know about 
HRL. I'm probably not going to like it. That's a food stock. Uh, yeah, let's draw an arrow on this one. Uh, if I can get my chart back. Uh, you know, net, net change, a draw an arrow, whatever you want to do. Net, net change from there to there. And then just complete your arrow. So it looks like it's headed lower. Uh, I would not short this one at this juncture, but long or short, I think it would be a short because the arrow is pointing lower on that one. GBT for Mr. Rick. What do you want to do with that, uh, Heath? You don't want to buy it, do you? GBT looks okay. Uh, it's biotech, obviously. Somebody said that we trade bios. Absolutely. It looks okay. I'd like to see a tiny bit more pullback. Unfortunately, if it pulls back much further, then you're back to the prior little breakout. But I'd say it's okay. Okay. Uh, it does have some overhead supply up around 45. But, hey, if I got in this stock and went from 25 to 45, I think I'd be all right with that. But I would just say it's okay. A few caveats. It does have some overhead supply, but it's okay. All right. Andre wants to know about HL. Hey, Andre, how are things in New York? How's the weather? Uh, on the next pullback. Okay, so we'd have to break out to new highs and then on the next pullback. Obviously, that's a, a silver stock. NTRA, we are long, obviously. Oh, no, we're not long that one. We're on uh, long in TLA. Uh, this is another one on one, one of those that's okay, okay? It looks all right. Uh, it's it's broken out. It's pulled back. It looks okay. I think you could do a lot worse. I do I do like IPOs when they come in, they scrape bottom for a while, then take off again. I mean, I would much rather have them just take off. I'm probably going to jinx myself. I'm, I'm long or or -E ETA, I think, or what is it? I forget the name of it. Oh, or -E ETA. R E T A. There it is. Uh, on an IPO pattern, I like them to just go straight up like this, okay? But sometimes those patterns where they come down, you know, they just come in and fail miserably and eventually bottom out and then bow tie or make uh, secondary patterns afterwards could be worthwhile. So, yeah, ideally, I like to go straight up. You're welcome, Angelo. Vive. V E V. Uh, one thing that immediately jumps out of me here is that it's losing steam. Okay, it accelerated higher, but now it's kind of losing a little steam. Uh, maybe if it had a knockout move sooner rather than later, but if it keeps losing steam like this, I'd be concerned. But yeah, keep that on your uh, on your watch list just in case. VCYT in a wedge. I'm not a big wedge trader. I'm not a fan of wedges. Where's my little thing here? VCYT, VCYT, never heard of it. Uh, yeah, it's too thin. This is only 50,000 shares on average volume. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I guess it's a wedge. I'm not a big fan of wedge trading, okay? Um, what, what what does a wedge say? Well, based on this, it would break lower, right? But, um, you know, I just draw my arrows. It's going sideways for months and months and months. Wait for it to begin to rally, but then too thin. Again, too thin to trade. Jim wants to know about VSLR. VSLR. Uh, this one's one. This is one that's been on my Landry list at least up until recently. The only thing I didn't like about it is it's just one big day off of lows. But I hear you. It looks okay. It's bottomed out. It's bow tying. But now it's just kind of coming back in. I I'd keep it on my radar, but that's why I didn't go as official recommendation, just because it was just that one big update in here. But yeah, good eye, Jim, on that one. Don't want to beat you up too much. It looks like Andre is over the – he's a bull on the metals. Uh, yeah, this would have to keep breaking out on a pullback. Absolutely. Keep that on your watch list. Sure. HMY. It's going to be Harmony. Oops. I don't know what I just plotted there. I don't know what that is. Let's get rid of that. Uh, again, another case of we'll have to break up the new highs and stay there. Come on, guys, momentum traders. Uh, it's gone down for three months or on a net-net basis has made any forward progress. 
so yeah, breakout and stay there. CDE, another another uh, that's going to be a uh, cold Dior or something. Core, core. How do you say that word? C O E or core. Uh, it would have to keep breaking out. If you're long, stay long because it looks beautiful. But it would have to break out and keep breaking out and then look to play the first pullback. Okay. MGP for Mr. Donald. MGP. MGP. Yeah, it looks good. Uh, it's a REIT. It's hard for me to get excited about REITs. Also, this is only a two-point move in here for an IPO. Eh, I'd have to be a little bit more excited. I mean, what, what what's the one more long? NTLA? NTLA? I mean, look at this. See, this is 22 to 30. That's eight divided by eight round numbers divided by 22. What is that? Divided by 22 equals. That's a 40% move round numbers, especially if you factor in the highs. Whereas this went from 22.50 to 25. That's what two divided by 25 round numbers. That's like an 8% move. So I like to see a, a much more substantial move in an IPO. An IPO is exciting. I want to see something exciting happen. I'm not really excited about going out and buy a, buying a REIT for hotels and IPOs. Not that I would never trade one. A friend of mine once said that if I found out that hyper, that uh, intravenous drug use was on the rise, I'd be buying hypodermic needles. I'm, I'm not that bad, but it's not on the rise, is it? BVN, boy, Andre is a bull on the metals. Uh, yeah, this is have to break out to new highs and stay there. It is breaking out now. But again, Andre, it'll have to make it to new highs and then look to play the pullbacks along the way. SREV for Mr. Sam. New face here. Good to see you. SREV. Uh, no, two sideways. Okay. Just draw your line, draw your arrows, okay? It was at four. So that's no momentum. Draw your sideways arrow there, okay? COTV. COTV, I sort of like, and it's, it's on my watch list. It's a little bit on the thin side, and it's also only moved a couple of points, but it looks okay. There's some breakout strategies uh, you could apply with this one. I'm not going to get into that because it's um, – that's that's in the course, but I'm not teasing you too much. I give away most of the stuff, as you know. I'm not. I don't hide anything. Um, that's one of the newer things that I do. Uh, no, this is this is just too sideways in here. Um, I hear you if you're thinking about shorting yet, but one, it's too thin to be shorting. Less than 200 shares, thousand shares on average. And two, if you're going to short something, short coming off of all-time highs, ideally, especially since the market is not too far from all-time highs. So, Joe, leave that alone. Jim wants to talk about NTES. NTES. Uh, well, for me to get excited about it, it would have to make it all the way to new highs and stay there. If it does roll over, eh, it's close to the prior highs in here. It might be worth a short, but I'll know when I see it. Not right now. John is a, must be a bull on the metals. So he wants to talk about EXK. EXK, it's a silver stock, I think. Uh, too many days of the pullback. So this is another case where it'd have to make it to new highs and stay there and then maybe look to pull back. Andre wants to talk about M as a short. No, Andre, it's in too long of a downtrend. We talked about this one last week. Um, I mean, if you had to go long or short, yeah, go short. But see this arrow I have drawn in here when you asked about it last week? This is where I think it was you. This is where you want to be trying to short a stock when it's coming off of high levels, not when it's already been beaten up way down. It's already lost half its value. I mean, I guess it could lose half again, but I'd leave it alone. RETA, yeah, Donald, we just talked about that on a pullback. This is a – I'm actually long this one, full disclosure. Uh, but, yeah, it looks pretty good so far. Break it out nicely. little IPO breakout pattern uh, happening there, one of my favorite new patterns that I trade. So, yeah, it looks pretty good, but on a pullback now. And hopefully that didn't happen soon. <laughs> okay, uh, this is too sideways. What do you want to do here? You want to buy it or sell it, Rick? Draw your arrows. If anything, it looks like it could be a trouble. You want to short it? It's not coming off of all-time highs, but I hear you. It looks like it's in trouble. Ideally, you want to see something coming off of all-time highs, at least given the nature of this particular market. So I would leave that one alone. Ring for Andre. Uh... Another gold, my boy. You you're bullish on them golds. 
Maybe that apocalypse is coming sooner rather than later. Andre and I talked about the apocalypse next uh, last time we were in uh, New York. Uh, certainly pretty scary stuff. Um, yeah, wait for wait for it to break out to do highs and look to trade pullbacks along the way. WI for Joe. That's gonna be what waste management or warehouser warehouser. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the stock looks like it's a trouble. It's only 13 on the HV, though, so it's kind of low in volatility, a little bit too low in volatility for me to get excited about. It's coming off of fairly substantial highs. Again, you want to find things off of all-time highs, at least in this particular market. Um, I hear you. It looks like it's in trouble. It's not set up just yet, though, and based on the low volatility of the stock, I think I would leave it alone. But I hear you. Sometimes these big, thick stocks with low volatility can be worth short, shorting, and that's why I call it the um, uh, go-go no-mo strategy. King's Cross, uh, yeah, it's coming back, but again, it's going to have to break, make it to new highs and then stay there. A lot of this reoccurring pattern within the uh, gold. You can hear me say the same thing over and over probably. GBT for Donald. We've got time for just a couple more. Yeah, we talked about this one. It looks okay. You could certainly do much worse. How about love, please? Well, I'm sorry, I'm taken. Uh, oh, you mean uh, Southwest. I kind of hate the airlines. My, my airline trading system is wait till they make new highs and then short them. <laughs> uh, wait till they go up and then short them. Um, just a horrible business. But I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, so let's just take a look at the chart. Uh, no, you, you haven't gone anywhere in a while. Just sideways, unless you want to short it, but it's not set up for short either. But, ugh, I hate the airlines. I guess it had a pretty good run in here, though. I can't uh, pick on that one too much. Yeah, uh, Heath, do me a favor. Uh, before next week, if you don't mind, or if you have time, I should say, feel free to come whether you do it or not. But uh, go to my store and go down to free reports and then uh, start by reading a 21-page report on my philosophy towards the markets. And then uh, watch a couple of week of charts just to get up to speed. So we, we are trend traders. TPRE or TPT? TPRE? TPRE? TPRE. Never heard of it. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's a relatively new issue. Well, 2014. Um, it's kind of improving in here, but still sort of sideways. It would have to break out for me to get excited, then maybe look for a pullback. But then look, you have a bunch of overhead supply to deal with. So uh, I would pass on that one based on that. Okay. Yeah, he don't uh, don't knock yourself out. Uh, you know, don't don't work too hard, but just get up to speed a little bit. And then I won't. Um, not that I beat you up today, but I won't beat you up uh, once you once you start knowing what we're looking for. Uh, this looks like it's bottoming out. But here's the deal: oil stocks have been taken off as of late. I'm not sure I would go after one that's that's that hasn't taken off yet, that has some overhead supply. I think you could probably find something better within the oil stocks out there. I mean, I hear you. It looks like it's bottoming longer term. Let's back the chart way out, see what we have. Yeah, I mean, it's bottoming long. It could be okay. I think for me to get excited about this, we don't have to get above eight. If it gets above eight, then you have some problems around nine and ten. So I think you could probably find something better in the oil and gas stock, Sam. If we had time, we'd take a look, but uh, we're out of time. All right, last one. Uh, yeah, we talked about that one already, uh, Donald. Okay, uh, MNK, last one. Uh, no, Karen. No, Karen, you need to go read those reports. Uh, this is sideways. Draw your arrow. All right, uh, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I, I obviously have a blast doing these. This is the highlight of my week. Oh, you're welcome, John. Um, I really appreciate you guys and girls showing up. A lot of ladies today, so welcome aboard, ladies. Uh, hopefully, I was wasn't too crude. Uh, <laughs> anyways, any questions? Literally, DavidDaveLander.com. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. And uh, if we don't talk again between now and then, uh, I'll see you. Uh, see you next week. Thank you so much.